Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, it is time to start our webinar today. My name is Mustafa Mukrain. I'm the Executive Director of the World Data System International Program Office, and I will be your host today. This webinar is part of a series of webinars hosted by the ICSU World Data System. And today, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Herbert van der Sampel from Los Alamos National Laboratory, who will give us a presentation on web-centric solutions for web-based scholarship. Before handing it over to Herbert for his presentation, I would like to give some quick technical information. Audio is currently broadcasted through your computer. Um, unfortunately, we cannot hear you if, if you talk, if you use your microphone. And we will be taking uh, questions, and Herbert will have an opportunity to answer, answer your questions in writing. I mean, your questions will be in writing, and Herbert will answer your questions verbally. So please use the question and answers panel available on the WebEx interface. And, and enter your questions as they come. No need to wait for the end of the presentation, and we will take them sequentially um, at the end. Um, so um, please, um, Herbert, um, I would like now to um, hand it over to you um, for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mustafa, for uh, inviting me to do this webinar. And uh, thanks, of course, to participants here uh, to tune in. Let me first check, uh, does my sound, uh, my voice come across loud and clear? Yes, Herbert, your voice is getting across loud and clear. Um, I'm, I will ask also participants and attendees listening to us to use the, the chat window in case they have any technical difficulties. Please contact me on the chat window. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, well, let's go. Um, when uh, Jane Hunter, actually, uh, she nominated me to present uh, a webinar in this series, and uh, I actually had to think twice uh, about what I was going to talk about. Uh, after all, this is a webinar series uh, with a focus on scientific data, and um, I do follow uh, discussions with that regard to some extent, but I definitely do not consider myself uh, to be an expert uh, on that matter. Uh, I am, uh, after all, largely into interoperability for web-based uh, scholarly communication and uh, research. But then uh, it actually occurred to me uh, that I am uh, regularly involved in uh, reviews of uh, research infrastructure projects or proposals. And uh, more often than not, I see infrastructure solutions being proposed and devised uh, as if the web did not exist. Uh, that is, uh, the web's existence is either plainly ignored or it is regarded as something one uh, just has to use not as something one should actually truly understand and embrace. So since obviously most research infrastructures include a research uh, data component, I thought this whole notion of truly using the web versus just piggybacking on the web uh, might be of interest uh, for this webinar. So given this consideration, uh, I thought it may actually be interesting to walk you through the evolution uh, over the past decade and a half of my own thinking with regard to interoperability for web-based scholarly communication. That's an evolution from what I call a repository-centric perspective in which the web is tolerated to a web-centric, uh, resource-centric perspective in which the web is fully embraced. Overall, my point will be that uh, web-centric thinking about interoperability is crucial for research, communication, and infrastructures. And I hope that is a message that will resonate uh, with those of you that are tuning in and are, are involved in infrastructure efforts. Anyhow, a long introduction. I'm going to uh, start my story uh, around 1999. 
with the creation of the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for uh, Metadata Harvesting, OAI PMH uh, in short. So the OAI uh, was a heroic, you could also say naive effort to try and fundamentally transform uh, scholarly communication. And the way we were going to go about that was uh, by promoting communication via preprints, so non-peer-reviewed free uh, papers. And the idea was be, uh, that you know, a peer review, if necessary, was going to uh, be provided in a layer on top of that free uh, literature. And uh, OAI took a technical approach uh, to achieve that goal. And uh, the goal was going to be to make preprints uh, easier to discover and access. And in doing that, they would actually be able to compete with established uh, journal literature. Yes, as I said, uh, it was all rather na uh, naive. We were still young in those days. There's actually two main reasons that I do want to talk about OAI PMH. One is to illustrate how much the web and our understanding of it has evolved since around 1999. And the second reason is that it provides such a beautiful illustration of using the web without actually truly embracing it. As you will see, it's not that we didn't want to embrace the web. It's because we, and most others actually, didn't know how to do so. So uh, PMH is a protocol uh, for the exchange of metadata uh, between uh, systems. And so this is where it already uh, gets interesting because we were focusing on metadata, making metadata discoverable, not full content. The reason was that the, a lot of materials in the repositories in those days were metadata only. Hardly any repositories had actual full content. If they had full content, then it typically was PDF. And in those days, search engines only indexed HTML, not PDF. Hence this focus on metadata. Second observation is that if one were to try and tackle a preprint discovery problem today, one would clearly approach it as a search engine optimization problem. We didn't do that in those days. And part of the reason was that search engines were at that time not truly considered an integral part of the web infrastructure. Today, obviously, they are. We cannot think about a web uh, without Google. So we approach this whole problem from a data provider, service provider perspective. And this is where the data provider is the party that holds the metadata and wants to allow others to use it to create certain kind of services. And this kind of perspective is what I refer to as a repository-centric perspective. So one defines interoperability in terms of a repository that holds content. And one defines a protocol you know, that is basically providing interoperability for access to that repository. It's actually really nice when you think about this repository-centric perspective to think of the repository as a library. You go visit the library, and there are rules and policies to allow you, that allow you to visit it. But well, that's actually uh, the protocol. Third, and this is the most important aspect, actually, obviously HTTP was available in 1999, but our understanding of what HTTP really was and what the web really was, that was still unclear. A couple of indications. First of all, there were true doubts about whether HTTP would stick. We had just lost Gopher. You know, that had been ditched down the drain. And so we thought, hey, maybe the same will happen with HTTP. The REST principles that are, you know, really famous now were not defined until 2000 in Roy Fielding's thesis. And the architecture of the World Wide Web, which I think is such a foundational document, that was not specified until 2004. 
as a result of all these factors, core web infrastructure concepts like the URI, the resource, the state of the resource, the representation of the resource, links and all, the true meaning of all of these were still unclear in 1999. All of this is very visible in how the protocol for metadata harvesting was conceived. And in a moment, I will give you three specific uh, illustrations. But even at the very basic level, it is visible. The protocol for metadata harvesting is all about interactions with the repository, hence with the server. The concept of a server is not even available in the web architecture document. The web architecture is all about resources identified by URIs. That's the core of the web architecture. The notion of a server doesn't even play a role in there. So let me give you those three specific examples that show how we maybe have wanted to embrace the web, but we didn't know how to. The first, clearly we didn't trust the HTTP. And there's two manifestations uh, in this slide uh, about that. One, we defined the protocol truly independent of HTTP. And then we said, here's how to encode it using HTTP requests. Second is, we did not use HTTP error codes to communicate between client uh, and server or server and client. Rather, we defined specific ones for the protocol that were conveyed in protocol payload, so in the information that was exchanged from the server to the client. Clearly something one would not do anymore today. Second observation. What you see there is a, a typical protocol request uh, in the protocol for metadata harvesting. It's a, a request to obtain a metadata record. So first thing you see here is that the URI does not identify a metadata resource. It actually is a request to obtain a metadata record. The identifier of the metadata record is actually carried as a parameter on that URI. Second, the HTTP is actually not truly used to obtain the metadata record. What is being done here is you use an HTTP GET, and in the HTTP GET, you say a second time, get the record. You see their verb, get record. So that's kind of a really interesting uh, aspect uh, in hindsight of looking at this protocol also. It's really not understanding what an HTTP GET meant. Third, when the response to a protocol request would be too long to fulfill in one response, a repository could actually chunk it up. And the way it did that was by means of providing a token in a response, which the client could then issue back to the server to obtain the next uh, chunk. This is actually a rather common approach in pre-web protocol. Uh, you know, Z39.50 actually also used that. This is something that one today, by all means, would tackle by providing the client with a link that it could just follow to the next chunk of information. So all of these indications that I'm pretty sure that we were trying the right thing, but we really didn't understand or didn't truly get how to do the right thing. So I'm going to fast forward now to uh, OAI ORE, and ORE here stands for Object uh, Reuse and Exchange. And the consideration in that effort, which started around uh, 2006, was that scholarly assets on the web were increasingly becoming compound. That means no longer they were just one object, like let's say the PDF file, but they started to consist of multiple things at the same time. So they might have been the PDF, but at the same time they might have been the data set, software, ontologies, workflows, online debate, slides, blogs, videos. So that was this notion of a compound uh, asset. And between all these resources that made up uh, a compound asset, there could be various relationships and interdependencies. 
And so what we tried to tackle in ORE was the question of how are we going to convey this compoundness in an interoperable manner so that applications could actually access, consume, and exchange uh, these kind of assets. By 2006, obviously, a lot has changed in the web. Many of the things that I mentioned were unclear in 1999 had definitely been clarified. REST had been defined, architecture of the World Wide Web had uh, been defined. We started to understand the power of the URI. Nevertheless, when you look at slides from early on in the effort, and so this is one from uh, mid-2006 when the effort had just uh, started up, you really see repository-centric interoperability thinking at play again. This picture actually isn't very different from the one I showed you earlier uh, for PMH. You see the repositories there, and they have interfaces. They have a put interface, harvest interface, obtain interface, and then at the right-hand side, you see a service that's going to interact with those interfaces exposed by repositories. So truly, very similar, actually, to what the protocol for metadata harvesting did. Fast forward about a year, and a fundamental shift had occurred in the thinking about uh, this problem. Rather than looking at this problem from the perspective of repositories, as we did in this former slide, we started to look at it from the perspective of the web and the web graph. So it's truly fundamentally taking a different perspective, not coming from within the repository looking outwards to the web, but coming from out there on the web looking at your repository. It's a fundamental, uh, or for, for us at least, involved in the effort, it was a fundamental and extremely important shift in thinking. And when you take that perspective, in essence, what the compound object is, it's a thing that consists of any number of URI identified resources that are out there on the web. They may resort in repositories. They may just sit out of there on whatever kind of web server. It doesn't matter. They are just URI identified resources that are part of the web graph. And so in order to show the compoundness, show that these resources belong together, what you really need to do is draw a line around those things that belong together and then provide the things, the union of these things that belong together with an identity. That's basically a perspective that comes from the web graph, the realization that these things are just out there on the web. We just need to draw a little line around them, provide them with an identity, and we have a compound object uh, on the web. And that's totally what we did with ORE. What you see here is the core of the ORE uh, data model, with at your right-hand side, uh, three resources, AR1 to AR3, that are components uh, of a compound object. And then what we did is basically well, we said, okay, let's introduce a new resource, and that's A1, and that's basically going to be the identifier for the aggregation of these three resources at the right-hand side. And then in order to make that clear, you know, that this is actually the case, we're going to publish a document on the web, and that's the one at the left-hand side. We call that the resource map. And the resource map is a machine actionable document. It's actually an RDF uh, document. And that document will actually say that A1, the resource in the middle, is an aggregation. And it actually aggregates these three resources at the right-hand side. So basically, <coughs> these components and in addition to that, the ability to discover from A1, the resource map that describes A1, those were the cores of, uh, of uh, the solution that we came up with in uh, ORE. The reason that you want to be able to discover the resource map that describes the aggregation from the aggregation URI itself is that it is the aggregation URI that would be referenced, and hence clients would happen upon the aggregation URI, 
and they would have to go find the resource map in order to understand what the aggregation uh, was all about. I actually knew that we were on the right track with this kind of an interoperability approach when sometime in 2007, I did an experiment with my team here at Los Alamos. And it was an experiment in which we were simulating uh, compiled objects, so publishing information about these compiled objects, so truly publishing resource maps uh, on the web. But not only were these resource maps talking about uh, compiled objects, so these aggregations, they were actually talking about dynamic compiled objects. What that means is that aggregated resources could be added or removed and or removed from an aggregation, and the aggregated resources could actually change representation over time. Obviously, as a result of this, the resource map that describes the aggregation would also evolve to reflect those changes. And the concern was that, okay, these aggregations are scientific, they're scholarly objects that are out there on the web. We will be interested in archiving them because archiving is an essential component of scholarly communication. But what if these things evolve over time? Well, in that case, we need to be able to archive their different states as these things evolve over time. The interesting thing is that when we set up this experiment and we started to publish these resource maps that described evolving uh, aggregations, we were able to create a solution to capture and archive these aggregations and their aggregated resources purely by using off-the-shelf web technologies. We used off-the-shelf web crawlers and we use things like the Wayback Machine that is operated by the Internet Archive. And in doing so, we could have the crawler just collect the resource maps, the crawler collect the aggregated resources that were mentioned in the resource map, everything was submitted to Web Archive. And this would happen recurrently time and again and again. And so we were basically able to use existing Web Archiving technology to revisit the evolution of these aggregated resources uh, over time. All of this, we were able to use these off-the-shelf tools because we had chosen for a web-centric design. If we had chosen to tackle this problem with a repository-centric design, we would have to create special purpose software to achieve the same uh, goal. So this was truly, for all of us, uh, of us involved in this effort, uh, a big uh, eye-opener. Once my eyes were open with that regard, there was no way back, and this uh, web-centric thinking has stayed with me ever since. So when you think about what we did to achieve interoperability in ORE, there's really two components. There's the component that I'm showing at the top of your screen, which basically are all the primitives of the architecture of the World Wide Web. They were all used, for obvious reasons, in the ORE solution. Resources, URIs, representations of resources, media types, links, content negotiation, for example, to obtain uh, your preferred serialization of resource map, some kind of RDF serialization. The second component was more about the semantics. This is where the typed links come in and controlled vocabulary for typed links. And this is where we chose to use the semantic web technology stack consisting of RDF to publish these machine actionable resource maps and RDFS and OWL as a means to define the ORE vocabulary. But these are the two components that are really at the basis of interoperability as uh, defined uh, in ORE. I'm now going to move on to the Memento effort, which uh, I actually started uh, with colleagues uh, around uh, 2009. And 
I'm doing so because Memento actually uses the same two components that you saw on the previous slide, but it implements the second component in a different way. So it offers somehow a similar uh, perspective of interoperability, but there's also a difference in implementation, which I think is truly uh, interesting. So Memento is all about adding a time dimension uh, to the web. We know that uh, web resources evolve over time, and that at any uh, specific moment in time, one can only obtain the current uh, representation of a resource by dereferencing its uh, URI. So the question really was, okay, I know that uh, this is the URI of the resource. I know that it has evolved over time. How can I use that URI of the resource and a data in the past to actually see what an old version of that resource looked like. So I'm not interested in the current version of the resource. I'm interested in a past version of this resource. And clearly you will see the link with the experiment uh, I described earlier. This whole notion of versions of resources has been uh, bubbling before uh, quite a while. So Memento looks at this problem not only from the perspective of scholarly communication, but from the perspective of the web in general. And in essence, it provides interoperability for time-based access to resource versions. And these resource versions can exist in web archives, but they can also exist in resource versioning systems, such as wikis of, or software versioning systems. Okay, so Memento is not only about web archives, it's just a general interoperability for time-based access to resource versions. For those that are not familiar with Memento, this is how it can work in your browser, for example. So at the left-hand side, you see the ICSU website as of today. But let's say I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in a past version, okay? So literally what I do, and what you see in the middle of the screen is a little calendar uh, icon thing uh, that you can use to select the daytime. This is provided by an extension for the Chrome browser. It's called Memento for Chrome. So in this calendar picker, I pick a daytime, in this case, August 1, 2013. Once I've done that, behind the scenes, the Memento protocol will do its magic. And I will arrive automatically at an old version of the ICSU uh, website or homepage uh, from some kind of a web archive. In this case, it's a page coming out of the Internet Archive, and it is dated August 15, 2013, not August 1, because, well, it seems that on August 1, no capture of that website uh, was made. If you don't know Memento, if you have never used Memento for Chrome, please install it. You'll see it's actually true uh, magic at play. How do we do this? That's what I'm going to try and explain to you now. So what you see in uh, this picture here is, uh, at the left-hand side, an original resource with its URI. Let's just say it's uh, cnn.com. And what you see at the right-hand side are two snapshots. We call those so prior versions of cnn.com. We actually call these mementos. So these were captures, prior versions of cnn.com that were archived uh, in the Internet Archive. And so the, the, the question really is now, uh, how can we interact with the original resource at the left-hand side to obtain an archived version of that resource as it exists out there uh, on the web? The interesting challenge with that regard is that your original resource, in many cases, is not aware of the details of all these mementos, meaning of their URIs, of their archival daytimes, and so on. So there is that disconnect. CNN.com doesn't know about all these copies of its past that are available in the Internet Archive and in other archives. So, but the insight here is that, well, but there is someone who knows about all these versions. That's actually the Internet Archive. And so what we do in the protocol is, is we say, okay, we are going to introduce a new resource 
in this environment, and we're going to call that resource a time gate. And this time gate is a resource that actually does know about the past of CNN.com. So in, the, in this depiction, clearly, the time gate would be operated at the end of the Internet Archive because that's where they know about all these past versions of CNN.com. So how do we now get from the original resource to that time gate? Well, this is where this typed link, but the different kind of typed link comes in. Here in the Memento protocol, we're using a link at the level of the HTTP protocol. So there's an RFC that's called web linking, and that basically allows you to insert a link at the level of HTTP protocol metadata. So these are not links embedded in HTML pages. These are links embedded in HTTP protocol interactions. And this link we're going to call TimeGate. In essence, what this means is when a client arrives at the CNN.com URI, but it says, well, I'm not interested at all in what CNN.com looks like today. I'm interested in its past. Then it is going to follow its nose using this time gate link to the time gate. Okay? Once it's at the time gate, the time gate is able of content negotiation, but it is content negotiation in the date dimension. So typical content negotiation is, for example, for a language or for media type. Here in Memento, we added the time dimension. So we say, well, the time gate is going to do content negotiation, but for time. So a client is going to say, I am interested in the past of re this resource around a certain date time. And then the time gate is basically going to redirect the client to the Memento that is closest to the requested data. So what we've done here is we've used two primitives of the architecture of the World Wide Web, links and content negotiation, but we typed the link and we embedded it in HTTP uh, protocol responses, and we took a twist on content negotiation, another primitive, but we said we're going to apply it in the data dimension. The bridge so that was the bridge from the present to the past. The bridge from the past to the present is actually very simple because these mementos in the Internet Archive, for example, they know that they are snapshots of CNN.com. So they can easily point back, again with such an HTTP link, to the original CNN.com resource. In this case, they're not going to use the time gate link, but the type of this link will be original. And in this way, we've basically built a bridge from the present to the past and the past to the present. So we've truly added the time dimension uh, to the web. When you look back at these two components that I showed earlier, actually, we use exactly the same ones at an abstract level. We use resource, URI representation. We use all of those exactly as in ORE. The difference comes in at the level of how we implement type links and control vocabularies for type links. Because in this case, we didn't choose for a semantic web stack, but we chose to use HTTP links, and we chose for link relation types not defined in RDFS or OWL, but rather you know, registered with IANA in the IANA link type uh, registry. This kind of an approach is commonly known as HATIOS, which stands for hypermedia as the engine of application state. And what this means in short is that a response that the client receives to a request it issued should be self-contained with regard to the affordances that are available to it to move from the state that is in to the next state in the application it wants to pursue. So that's why it's called hypermedia, meaning these links, these type links, is the engine, you know, how it makes it work of the state of the application. This is a common uh, paradigm, and this is what we use basically in a memento to achieve interoperability. I have started to explore this kind of interoperability paradigm in an effort that goes under the umbrella 
signposting uh, the scholarly web. The slide at the bottom here has a URI uh, of a YouTube video in which I show how a rather common problem in web-based scholarly communication can be tackled uh, using this kind of an HATIOS uh, approach. I cannot go into detail. I invite you to look at uh, the slide to make it short as uh, the video, sorry. To summarize though, what this problem is about, it's a very common one. It is about the relation between the DOI and the landing page that one arrives at when one dereference that you arrive. It is about which links on the landing page actually point to resources that are part of the DOI identified object and which are not. It is about given the URI of a resource that is part of DOI identified object, for example, the PDF file, how do I figure out which DOI it resorts under? This is an extremely important question, by the way, when you think uh, of web-centric uh, annotation. Another issue addressed here is, well, who are the authors of the DOI identified object and all these uh, you know, resources that uh, fit underneath it? This is just one pattern that can be tackled using the HATIOS approach. There's many others. At the very end of this presentation, actually in the annex of the presentation, I have a few uh, more that we could go into if there were uh, time left for it. But let me move on towards uh, conclusions, basically. What I've tried to show is an evolution that I went through away from a perspective on interoperability that was characterized by establishing interoperability between repositories, between servers, between applications, and characterized by piggybacking on the web infrastructure. Yeah, we were using it, but not truly embracing it. It is a perspective that makes the action radius of interoperability small because you're talking within your community that is going to implement your interoperability specification. And I've evolved towards this perspective that can be characterized by interoperating with the web infrastructure itself. So rather than interoperating between repositories, for example, you start by interoperating with the web infrastructure by embracing its primitives. Then you know, the primitives and the technologies that are directly related to that. This allows you to interoperate within your target community, as you wanted to do anyhow, but potentially also with others. So the action radius of your potential interoperability increases. It also makes it possible to use tools that are created by others that fundamentally embrace the web architecture and for others to use your tools. And at the more philosophical level, what you achieve is a true integration of the scholarly discourse, you know, with other discourse that is happening on the web. To summarize, I've also shown you that in this web-centric kind of approach, I've basically taken two different strands, one based on the semantic web stack and the other the HATIOS kind of approach. The semantic web stack was used in OAI ORE and open annotation in which I was also involved. It's also used in W3C Prov and in research objects which builds on OAI uh, ORE. When you try to characterize when you can want to use this kind of approach, typically one addresses a very specific problem and this approach provides you with very extensive descriptive expressiveness. Typically what you do, you publish additional documents to the web that are machine actionable and that adhere to certain profiles. They reveal relationships about resources, properties, and so on and so on. We must admit that there is a non-trivial barrier to entry with the use of this kind of technology stack. And that's illustrated by the rather slow adoption, one has to admit, of some of the uh, efforts that I uh, listed uh, on top there. So the other approach is the HATIOS approach, 
which is based on HTTP links. I am a link relation types. This is what I used in Memento. This is what we also used in resourcing. Resourcing is really a specification that revisits the problem domain that was at the core of the protocol for metadata harvesting. But this is not about metadata only. This is actually about synchronizing all kinds of resources uh, across the web. And so also in signposting the scholarly web, this is the logic or the approach that I follow. Here one typically addresses a rather broad problem. Just think about memento, time-based access across the web, right? This provides you with more coarse kind of expressiveness. The thing is that these IANA relation types are on purpose very coarsely defined in order for them to be usable in rather different broad kind of context. So typically what you do here, you publish links that support discovery of certain types of resources. These give you the affordances for the client to step from one state to another in its application. Here, what you see is a lower implementation bar barrier because one uses a rather familiar protocol stack, technology stack, HTTP namely. And although the interoperability that one achieves is a bit more coarse, one can have a very significant uh, return on uh, the investment. So with that, I think uh, I've reached my uh, conclusion and I think uh, we can go to uh, what well, questions if there are any. Thanks a lot for uh, staying with me. Apologies, Herbert, I, I was having problems unmuting myself. Uh, thank you for this very enlightening presentation. Can you hear me, Herbert? Yes, I can hear you, but can others hear me because I, I yes. saw a couple of disconcerting yes. uh, messages coming. Messages. Yeah, that's what I was in fact saying, but I was uh, muted. Um, many uh, participants had audio problems apparently, uh, which, uh, which is a bit sad, and they had to drop. Oh. Uh, but as I indicated in the chat window, that the recording will be available, and if you agree, Herbert, we might circulate, um, uh, um, maybe not your personal email, but uh, our uh, IPO email for questions directed to you after listening the the, the recording. Okay, um, sure, of we course. Will, okay, excellent. Um, uh, we will take questions and answers from participants who who were able to listen to the to the presentation. So please you locate the question and answer uh, present, uh, panel on, on the WebEx interface if you have any specific questions you want to, to ask Herbert. Otherwise, as I indicated, we will uh, circulate an email address uh, with the link to the recording for uh, questions after, uh, after this webinar. Um, I hear here um, in the question, it's not a really a question, but from Claire Austin. Uh, who says, very nice presentation, and she's glad she has joined this webinar. Uh, we will, I will wait uh, a couple of minutes to see if any other incoming questions um, arrive. Otherwise, um, Herbert, um, personally, I, I would like to say that uh, I've learned a lot through your presentation. Um, I, and I, want, I had a, maybe one specific question. Um, although I, I have to say, dealing with the technical issues, I was not very concentrated. So please okay. <laughs> don't hesitate to tell me I answered the question in the in the talk. Um, when it comes to data, um, I think I was I was really impressed by your model where you said the interoperability should not or not should not, but instead of concentrating on interoperability between repositories, uh, which is um, probably time consuming because there are many of them, we should concentrate on uh, trying to interoperate with the, the web uh, using web protocols. Um, so I was wondering if you were familiar with some approaches already in the context of research data when it comes to trying to achieve this interoperability using um, the, the web protocols. I'm, I'm thinking in particular for what is uh, about what is called the, the brokering uh, approach. I don't know if you've heard about it. 
to, to what extent yes, well, it uses... I actually it, received... Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, to, to what extent it uses uh, the, the approach you highlighted using the web, existing web protocols and it's not trying to reinvent the wheel, if you are familiar with it? Well, actually, uh, just today I received an email from uh, people involved in the Open Air project about this brokering approach. Uh, so I actually was not able to look up uh, exactly uh, what they were uh, doing there. So I, can, I cannot really uh, answer your question at this point. I may be able to answer it, you know, once I've looked up what is really going on with that regard. Uh, one thing I would like uh, to point out, though, is there is a really interesting effort going on at the W3C under the umbrella of uh, best practices for data on the web. And uh, this really, uh, so as it says, it's best practices. It's not about specifying uh, specific ways that you have to implement things. It's more about higher level things that one needs to take into account when publishing uh, data on the web. Versioning of data is one of the issues that come up there. And in that context, for example, Memento is mentioned. So this is truly an effort that is worth uh, looking into. It, I think it's very promising. Excellent. Thank you very much, Herbert. I will, I will also um, put you in touch with one of our working groups uh, dealing with um, data publication services. They're trying to interlink um, literature with, with data sets, and I think they, it, it might be interesting to, to cross perspectives here and, and to see. Uh, and Open Air is actually involved. The Open Air project is, is involved in this activity. So if you, if you don't mind, I will probably um, uh, circulate your, your uh, email to, the, to that group. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, in the annex of this presentation, I have uh, a scenario that is exactly about connecting paper and data using this HATIOS kind of an approach. Excellent. So what I would do is actually circulate that slide with a copy to you <laughs> and inviting them to, to maybe initiate a dialogue with you. Okay, sure. Um, I have one incoming question uh, here, uh, so I would read it out. In this context, what issues do research scientists need to be most aware of when preparing their data during the course of a research project? So I, so I think this is more a question about the researchers themselves and not about the platforms on which researchers are actually publishing uh, their data sets. The issues that I was talking about, the interoperability that I'm talking about, truly is at the level of these kind of portals, these kind of systems uh, that expose research information, published information uh, on the web, and creating interoperability across those kind of systems. I think the question that we're uh, seeing here from Claire is about the content of the data itself and what should we take into account there. This is actually much more in the realm of best practices for data on the web. So there are aspects in that effort that are targeted at the researchers, so at the people that are creating uh, the data and uh, are interested in sharing the data, as well as aspects that relate to those that become the custodians of that data, how they should expose it uh, to the web. Very good. Thanks, Herbert. Um, I think uh, we have no more questions pending. Let me just double check that I didn't miss any. Um, no, I think we have no more questions coming in. So with this, um, and I notice uh, Jane Hunter joined the webinar. Um, I don't know at what point, but uh, I will uh, thank Jane also for introducing Herbert to me. and. Um, Thanks, Herbert, uh, very much for his uh, very good presentation. Um, Herbert, any last word? Oh, no, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, a little bit sad that a lot of people had to sign off, uh, but as you said, uh, if we can make the audio and the video basically available uh, for all of this, then we can interact uh, by other means later on. Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone, and I wish you a good night or a good day, depending on your time zone. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Thanks.